welcome to Pigeon River Farm, doing farming right. I'm Robert Brown, the owner of Pigeon River Farm. Thank you for viewing. Good evening. In tonight's episode, we're going to talk about local food and how important it is in this current climate we're dealing with out there with uh, global food issues, national food issues, runaway inflation. So well, let's talk about local food and what it takes for you to go out and get a relationship going with a farmer. So I'm going to have to voice this from my perspective. And our perspective here is we have a very tight-knit community here. So, and we're also living in a, a relatively strong farming area. So there's an awful lot of farmers. So my market for selling our food, or what we classify as local food to others, is going to be our surrounding cities. So within 35 to 50 miles, we have four medium-sized cities. So I always joke we're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of everywhere. And these cities are our, our area that we sell the majority, if not all, of our food into. Uh, we use a distri distribution system, so we actually, you know, I guess we'd say wholesale. So we actually have a, a, a contract with a company who distributes our food and many, many other small farms. We do a little on-farm sales, but predominantly through that distribution. So our, the miles traveled for our food is approximately 50 miles. That's a key ingredient here. When you start thinking about the shipping, trucking, airline costs of getting your food to your door, how far do you think that that number that I've always been told is approximately 1,300 miles is the average trip that the food that's on your plate takes. Uh, that's just a national average, so every year is going to vary widely. So being in the, in the north, uh, when we get our a lot of our fruits is an example. Uh, they're going to come from a long distance away. They're going to be Florida, California, Arizona, down to Mexico, South America, on you know over to Europe and, and Asia and so on. The, so the food travels a long distance, and it, it's a, a wonderful system, and it's worked and it's worked amazingly well. It's actually I think the thing is it actually worked too well. Now we're on the other side of this with the incredibly high cost. Uh, fuel, inflation running away, and now I could get, I'll do a whole other video on this, but all these restrictions on export, restriction on fertilizer, and so on, <clears throat> the need for you to be in relationship with your local farm is going to be very, very critical. So what does your local farmer want to see in a customer? So let's look at it from that perspective first. It isn't only about money. It's also about somebody respecting the work that they're put forth. If we strictly do it on price point, uh, then you might as well work with the big multinational companies because they're going to cut every penny they can to get the product to your door. In the case of a local farm, most of them that I know nationwide, I've had the luxury of meeting a lot of people through Grassworks is an example, so I know a lot of grazers from throughout the nation <coughs> involved with the Organic Association. I've been to a lot of conferences and there again met farmers from all over. One common thread is we respect, love the land, we respect what we do, and we hope that our customers can appreciate all the love and care we put into this food and producing this food. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that when you are communicating with your future farmer, uh, however that methodology is going to be, uh, if you're going to find them on social media. I would say a good percentage of farmers work with social media. Um, it's kind of an age thing, I would think, more than anything else. But you also got to remember that <clears throat> farmers are very busy. So to spend all the time on social media is very difficult. So a lot of them don't necessarily utilize. So you need to go out and search that customer out, or that, excuse me, that uh, farmer out. One of the keys is going to be is utilizing where is the food coming from in the, in the stores. Do some Google searches. Find out where that farm, like an example, when you go to a, a food store, it's not beyond question to ask the manager, where did you get them eggs? Where did you get that milk? Where did you get them potatoes? Whatever it might be. 
that's well within your right to find that out and then encourage that store owner or manager to try to source locally that is going to be the easiest step out there that's easiest for you because you've already been going in it's in your community uh, possibility that store will actually reach out and work with small farmers we are going to be a little more complicated to to work with uh, not that we don't we want to work smoothly with everybody it just gets into the whole business of farming so when you're selling to a store uh, you ship your merchandise based on uh, contract and I hate to say it the way some of them work you'll get paid when they feel like it uh, so that so cash flow for a small farm can be difficult so that's one uh, working with your local store but be aware of a lot of these dynamics the smaller the store you go with the more likelihood that they'll actually be dealing with local farms Number two, of course, is the obvious, but these are very seasonal, there is some year round, is the farmer's markets. Uh, farmer's markets work for some farmers. I have definitely nothing against them. They actually work really good, but uh, they'll, they'll work for us. We've, we've tried a different combination of farmer's markets and we found that our model works the best working with a uh, distributor that gets it right to the store. It just, it's one of the things because we are limited on the time. So you gotta think about a farmer's market the farmer has to leave their operation, pack up, put everything on display, hope the customer shows up, and then in turn, make the sales, pack up, get back, and then get back to work. So you can see there's a lot of time spent that many times is unrecoverable. Uh, the next one that's really good is the CSA. Uh, you know, community supported agriculture is uh, is unbelievable model. Um, I think it's it's great and if you have a CSA in your in your community that is one that I would highly recommend going with is you have a variety you have your conventional vegetable CSA and now we're getting into a lot of them that are egg meat milk maybe milk derivatives like cheese and you'll have yogurts and the like <clears throat> them work good and because the CSA you're paying typically up front, it gives a farmer some cash flow. And respectively, it, the cash flow is there that allows them to operate more efficiently and then the flexibility of the customer to accept based on how, you know, performance of whatever they're doing here, if it's vegetables or if it's milk or, or so on. And there, a lot of stuff can, some is extremely seasonal vegetables. Some can have ups and downs, like the egg business. We are we struggle during the cold months, you know, the dark months. I guess we'd say November, December, January. Egg production is just almost impossible to get it where you need it to be. And then, of course, the spring of the year, you often have too many eggs. So then, are some of the challenges that uh, with. so the CSA really balances that out. So the CSA is really good. The biggest issue with the CSA that I see is the distribution getting somebody to get that product to you. So it takes a lot of logistics background. And not every farmer is gonna not only have all the other you have to figure out how you're gonna get the product to a destination or to the individual's house and so on. So there's some challenges for that, but definitely go out and do some searching on CSAs in your community, see if there's a, a, a good option there. The next one is gonna be um, farmers on farm sales, a farm stand, an on farm store. Now that works real well, but now it depends on where the farm's at, and you immediately can recognize a, a challenge here. If you have, say 50 customers coming from one, one city, coming to your farm, that's 50 individual trips. That's a lot of interaction with the customer. Per, from the environmental cost, all that standpoint, that's a lot of vehicles traveling out to get the food from the farmer and going back, unless, you're, unless the farm's located in the proximity of the city. Getting more rare every day. You know, usually the farm becomes a subdivision. So as that unfolds, the food source keeps moving out farther. So that is 
one of the more difficult. It's relatively easy for the farmer. It ha leaves the largest margin of anything because they're coming to you. You don't have any middleman. You have just your fixed costs on the farm. So very desirable. Downside is, of course, is the travel for the consumer to you. And then depending on how the structure is set up, there can be a lot of time spent uh, with the customer. So from the farmer's perspective. So them are all challenges that have to be thought of. But I guess from a critical standpoint, we as small farmers need you. We need the customers to buy our product. You as the customers need the small farmer. If your goal is to rely on big corporate farms from going forward, I see this is going to be a real problem. Uh, under you know the capitalization issue, who knows where that's going to go. You have the big problems here with global trade. Um, if things get worse internationally, uh, food disruptions can be very real. So again, we would, we would all prefer if we're in it together in our local community. If you're supporting your local farmer, the local farmer is going to have the ability to pay for the more expensive fertilizers. He's going to be able to do a lot of things that need to be done by expensive seed fertilizer, all them things that it's going to take to get that food. You're, you have, you're part of the game, but you're also part of the solution. You, with your wallet, with your involvement, with you, and it's ironic, uh, some of our customers, uh, some of our on-farm, uh, that come to our farm customers have been phenomenal. The resources you tap into, you know, their, their knowledge of different areas, uh, you know, banking, chemistry, whatever it might be, very blessed. Uh, that can be very beneficial, so don't overlook your skills that you can bring to the farm and help them with their operation in turn giving you food security. I've been working on getting to this point. So food security is the bottom line of the whole thing. We as farmers appreciate you buying from us, you appreciate, you appreciate us producing. But when it's all said and done, a neighbor, somebody close, somebody in your community, somebody in your area, whichever term you want to use, is going to be the one that's going to really take care of you if this thing goes south, if it really gets in, in serious trouble. So think about that because you can lean on your farmer and ask, say, hey, we're really, really tight here. You can think you come up. Usually, depending on, on the situation, they're going to have flexibility. Go to your store and try that. It ain't going to happen. So them are the things that I wanted to bring up. I hope this was uh, insightful uh, toward the concern coming here with the, the, well, I guess we'd say the food dilemma to apocalypse, where that's going to land. And so I appreciate your time. Uh, listening and have a most wonderful evening.